Do you realize it has been 35 weeks since we started the book of Acts? 35 weeks. When we began it, I thought this was just a great idea, but I had no idea what this year would bring. The divisiveness, the turmoil, the, the anger in our country right now. And yet the Word of God every week seems somehow to, to apply to our lives. And what we're studying seems so current to what we're facing. Well, this morning, we're jumping into the story of all stories in the New Testament. It has a bizarre twist and a turn in the ending that will just leave us dumbfounded. And I'm sorry to tell you that I'm only going to be able to have time this morning to tell you what happened. I won't have the time to get into how we need this story in our lives and in our minds today. That's, that's going to have to come next time. But let me remind you, we are talking about a culture 2,000 years ago that is divided in some amazing ways. They are divided politically. They are divided racially. They are divided economically. It is a time and place where Christianity is, it doesn't have much to stand on. But it is needed more than, than they ever thought possible. And if it sounds like I'm describing today, I get that. Because there's a lot of similarities that, and we're going we're to start digging into some of those similarities this morning, and we will continue next time. But for now, let's just jump in and, and see what happened 2,000 years ago so that we can see what we should be doing right now. And before we do that, though, I, I need to catch you up a little bit, just in case you're new to this Christianity thing. After they crucified Jesus down in Jerusalem, after he rose again, the church began to spread out because of this intense persecution. And at the very heart of this persecution, we were introduced to a guy named Saul. He was one of the Pharisees, a respected member of the Sanhedrin, probably not at the very top level, but, but maybe close. He was, one of, he was one of the up-and-comers. He had a bright career ahead of him, and he oversaw the stoning of a young man named Stephen, a Christ follower. And Saul saw how the mob wanted more killing, more death. And he realized nobody's playing the role of hitman for the church. Nobody's playing the role of protector for God. And that's what Saul saw himself as. Make no mistake about it. Saul is not against God. In fact, Saul wants to uphold the Old Testament so much so that he would kill anybody who dares to say that a Jewish carpenter could be the Messiah. And in Acts chapter 9, we read about that day that Saul is carrying orders in his hand on his way to Damascus. He's, he's told that he needs to wipe out a new upstart church. And along the way, a blinding light drives him to his knees. And there's a voice within the light that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And for three days, he's left blind. And over the next decade, Saul, who is now Paul, begins to understand the love and the grace and the mercy of God. And then about six weeks ago, we read in Acts chapter 11 that some amazing things began to happen way up here in the area of Antioch. God is moving in this city, changing lives and changing hearts. And, and it's not just the Jewish people, it's the, those people, the Gentiles. And so a man named Barnabas is sent from Jerusalem, which is way down here. You can't even see it on the map because it's too far down. He's sent from Jerusalem up to Antioch to check it out. And once Barnabas arrives in Antioch, he finds out that Paul is over here in the city of Tarsus preaching. 
And so he sends a word to him, man, you got to come over here. you got to see what's going on for yourself. You're not going to believe this. So now Paul shows up at Antioch, and before long he begins to wonder, you know, if, if God can do miracles here with these people, man, I wonder what God could do somewhere else with other people. And so he decides to take the gospel message on the road to other regions and other nations, and he begins his first what we now call a missionary journey. And he's joined by Barnabas and another guy named John Mark. And they set out for this area right here, the island of Cyprus. And they make their way over to right about here, the city of Paphos. And then three weeks ago, we read that the story of Paul and meeting with that ruler in the city of Pathos. And, and remember, one of the sorcerers tried to intervene and tried to interrupt things. And, well, you remember, it didn't end real well for that sorcerer. Well, this is all John Mark needed to see. And here he decides to go back to Jerusalem. He makes it all the way across to, to Perga, but then this blue line shows he, him heading back home. He's had enough. And then last week we saw Paul and Barnabas, they make their way from from Perga up to the little city up here of Antioch, Pisidia. And Paul delivers this long speech. And it's almost as if Luke puts this in the Bible so that from here on out, when we see that Paul went to the synagogues and he preached, we can flip back to Acts chapter 13 and go, yeah, I know what he preached. Here it is. He didn't preach against the racism of the day. He didn't preach against the government of politics or the overreach. He didn't preach against the economy of the day. He preached, let me show you God and who he has always been and his promise and his love for you. Let me show you what he's done and how he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And let me show you what Jesus did. And let me show you how God came, not just to forgive your sin, but to make you righteous, to produce a new life within you. And in that town of Pisidia, Antioch, many believed and many didn't. And the ones that didn't finally got the magistrates on their side and and they had Paul and Barnabas kicked out of town. And that was at the end of Acts chapter 13. That's where we left this story last week. Paul and Barnabas shaking the dust off their sandals. It's that Jewish sign that we will take nothing of you with us when we leave. Not even the dust from your streets will go with us because of the way you have treated us. And so they leave Pisidia, Antioch, and they make their way over here to Iconium. And this is where we're going to pick up our story this morning. At the beginning of chapter 14, Verse 1, if you don't already have your Bibles open, flip it open to Acts chapter 14, verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual to the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. Isn't that interesting? Go back to the end of verse 2. So what do people do that didn't like the message, the ones that didn't want to hear and didn't want anyone else to hear either. They poisoned their minds against their brothers. Oh, church, how much poisoning of minds is going on in our world today? Over the last few weeks, we've talked about the the amount of opinions that there are on, on so many issues today. How many of us then are being poisoned against each other? How can you think that way and call yourself a Christian? How can you vote that way and still say that you're a person of faith? How can you make that decision? How can you believe that rhetoric? How can you you approve of that and still say, I'm a Christian? There's so much of that happening in our world today. Now, I got to tell you, 
if I'm in a place where everybody's poisoning minds against me, you know what I would do? I think I would do what Paul and Barnabas did in the last chapter. I'd be shaking the dust off my sandals like I'm out of here. I didn't sign up for this. I don't need this. Or maybe, maybe I'd be like John Mark and I'd just simply say adios. I'm going home. I've had enough and I can't go on anymore and, and, and this isn't any fun and I'm out of here. But what did these guys do? Verse 3, so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord. What? There's so much friction. There's so much animosity. Paul and Barnabas go, yeah, this is awesome. We need to stay here longer. It makes no sense to me. But you've got to understand, this is a place that needs love. This is a place that needs grace. This is a place that needs mercy. Oh, church, look around. That's what's going on here today. We are in a place through our news, through our social media, through our schools, through our politics, even in our economy. There is so much poisoning of minds right now. And in our world, it's, it's not as easy to just pick up and dust the sandals off and go on to the next town. So what is Paul's answer? Let's spend more time sharing God's love. Let's spend more time being people of grace and mercy. And because of that, verse 3, the, the, verse three says that the Lord confirmed their message of grace by enabling them to produce signs and wonders. You know what happens when people start being people of grace? You know what happens when, when Christians start actually giving the same grace that they've received? You know what happens when Christians start giving the same patience that God has given to you? When Christians start sharing that same love that God has given you? God's power shows up in some amazing ways. We don't know what the signs and wonders that Paul did, but we're about to find one of them because this story is about to take a crazy turn. This was a time, this was a culture where God says, you want to be people that move in my grace and not in your flesh? Watch me show up. My friends, I don't know how God is going to show up in your life or in my life or even in our church. But let me promise you this, if we are Christ followers, if we are dedicated to bringing grace and bringing love into a place where hearts are being poisoned, I promise you, we have a God that says, that's where I'm going to be. That's what I'm all about, and I will show up. And for Paul and Barnabas, watch what happens. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. So not only do we have a divided culture, not only do we have a race card that's being played here, but now we've got a conspiracy going on. Hmm. I wonder if that could be happening in the world anywhere today. Verse 6. But they, being Paul and Barnabas, they found out about it. And they fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the gospel. So they start in Iconium and some amazing things happen. But, but here's what we're going to find. The moment people start taking a stand for Christ, there's opposition. People start stirring up things. And minds and hearts are being turned against each other. And one day, there's this knock at the door. And they're told, guys, you've got a lot of people against you. But now the magistrates in town are in on it. There's a plot out there to kill you. Now, mind you, it can't be done under Roman authority because Paul is a Roman citizen by birth. And you can't just kill a Roman citizen without Rome giving its stamp of approval. But there's a conspiracy going on, and the city leaders 
are in on it. And it's time to get out of town. So Paul and Barnabas go to Lystra, and it also mentions the town of Derby. But what happens in this little town of Lystra? It's, it's going to be huge. Just watch this. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had the faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. So Paul's there teaching in the town square in the, in the temple, and he sees this beggar in the crowd. Friends will bring him there every single day. He can't walk on his own. He never has since birth. But Paul sees the man's face and in his eyes, and he sees the faith that Paul has in his own heart, and he knows And Paul will say the words that Jesus once said down in Galilee. Stand up on your feet. And immediately, molecules rearrange, bones strengthen, muscles get strong and and, and begin working. And this man stands up and he starts jumping. And now everyone in the city has seen this. This man, since youth, has been brought out every single day to the temple so he could beg for scraps of food or change. He's like a landmark in the city. Everybody knows him, and everybody helps him. And now the crowd sees this man dancing and jumping around. Watch what happens. And then after this, I'll give you the back story. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language. Circle, highlight, underline that. Paul knows a lot of languages. Lyconian is not one of them. They shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bowls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you bringing you the good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and earth and the sea and and everything in them. In the past, he let all the nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He's shown his kindness by giving you rain from the heavens and, and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. And even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. So this entire city just explodes. It goes crazy. Why? Well, in order to understand this, you have to know something about this fable. It's a Greek fable about a Greek god. It goes back way before the Roman occupation of this area. You see, everybody knew about the Greek gods, Hermes and Zeus. But but when your city plays a prominent part in the story of Greek gods, especially Zeus and Hermes, oh, I promise you, everybody in town knows it. And here's the back story. Every little kid grew up listening to mom at night. As she would tuck them into bed, she'd run her fingers through their dark hair trying to get them to fall asleep, and they would hear the story about the day the gods came and visited their city. It is the most prominent story in Greek mythology for this area, and it goes something like this. One day, 
Zeus and Hermes came and visited Lystra, but they came dressed in rags as poor homeless beggars. They entered the city and began knocking on doors, begging for food and lodging, but no one gave them lodging. No one gave them food. No one gave them even water. Everyone in Lystra was extremely unfriendly, and no one would give them the time of day. They were rejected hundreds of times. Finally, at the edge of town, Zeus and Hermes came upon an old woman and her husband named Bacchus and Philemon. They were two poor peasant, uh, peasant farmers. Now, don't get Philemon confused with the Philemon of the Bible. Same name, different person. But this husband and wife quickly welcomed Zeus and Hermes, these strangers, into their home and offered them all the food and drink that they had. They even tried, unsuccessfully, mind you, but they tried to kill, catch and kill their only goose to eat to the amusement of the strangers. Bacchus and Philemon entertained their guests wonderfully until nightfall. Then the old couple gave them their bed to sleep in as they slept on the floor. The next morning, Zeus and Hermes showed themselves to be the gods that they were. They went back and they turned everyone that didn't offer hospitality in the city of Lystra into frogs. And that poor peasant farmer and his wife, Zeus and Hermes, made their house a house of gold and marble. In fact, when Paul and Barnabas walk into Lystra, just outside the gates, they pass that home of gold and marble. It is now the temple to Zeus. You see, this is the story that's been passed down for generations. So now, knowing this backstory, you can understand why it went crazy in Lystra when these two strangers showed up. They come into town. They're not dressed like they're rich. They look like they might have just gotten kicked out of the town before. And yet they start teaching. One is more solemn and quiet. The other is more authoritative and, and seems to be more like the spokesperson. And they bring power. And they bring healing and a man that you have known since birth is now walking. And you see this happen right in front of your eyes. And the people of Lystra quickly put two and two together. And they think, wow, Zeus, Hermes, they've come back. They're back to visit our town again. We have been waiting all day just to, to show them. We've been waiting forever to give them the hospitality they deserve. Man, we all want homes of gold and marble. If we can be nice to them, oh, we're going to be blessed. We're going to be rich. And they all start shouting and celebrating. And everyone comes out of their house and their shops and they all join in. Now, understand, Paul and Barnabas are just sitting there going like, this is weird. They don't know the backstory. They don't know the Greek mythology. And this, I mean, so we've healed a guy and that's kind of cool. And, and I get that there's a, there, there should be a parade. There should be a reception, but this is a little over the top. And then the priest from the temple. The temple of Zeus just outside the city. He brings in two bulls, and the bulls have wreaths around them. And they're going to sacrifice them to Paul, who they th think is Hermes, and Barnabas, who they think is Zeus. And so Paul and, Her uh, Paul and, and Barnabas tear their clothes. It's, a, it's that symbol, that, that Jewish sign that you've gone too far. That it's that sign of mourning, that sign of grief. They're like, guys, we're nobody. We're just human like you. We're here to tell you about the real God who brings rain, the real God who blesses your crops. And verse 18 says, even with that, even in the midst of all of that, man, they just, they have a hard time keeping the crowd from offering them sacrifices. And here comes the twist. Watch what happens. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. You remember those two towns. They just got kicked out of them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples gathered around him, he got up and 
And he went back in the city. And the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Are you kidding me? You enter this city and there are amazing ups. And you heal a man, an incredible up. And you got this parade, this parade. It is the best reception you've ever had in your life. And then all of a sudden, oops, mistaken identity. And everything comes crashing down. And some Jews are visiting from Antioch and Iconium, the two cities that just kicked them out. And they're going, Paul? Barnabas? Yeah, yeah we know those guys. We, we just kicked them out. And the crowd's like, hey, these guys are trying to pull a fast one. They're trying to deceive us. We got all riled up because I've been waiting since I was a little boy to, to, to make amends with Zeus and Hermes. And somebody picks up a rock. And bang, right off of Paul's noggin. And the rest of the crowd says, yeah, that's a good idea. We're not waiting for Roman authority on this one. We're not taking this to a magistrate or to a judge on this one. We got rocks. And they stone Paul. And they grab his body, probably unconscious, and drag it outside the city gates and just leave it. Because they don't want the Roman authorities coming around asking questions. Let's take him down with rocks. Let's drag his body outside. And let's get out of here. And I love verse 20. The brothers, the Christians, gather around. I don't know what happens. Most of the time when you stone somebody, it's not just to teach them a lesson. The only time you stone someone is to kill them. It's a death sentence. Maybe, maybe they did it quick because they, it was stirring up a mob. Maybe they were in a hurry because Rome says you can't kill a Roman soldier or a Roman citizen unless you have our permission. But when the brothers and sisters of faith, the disciples, gather around and pray, maybe a miraculous healing of his bones takes place. I don't know how to explain it, but something miraculous happens. And Paul gets up, and he goes right back into that city. And they realize after one night, this isn't a place for us to stay. And the next morning, they leave, and they go to Derby. And this is where we have to leave it this morning. Oh, I wish we could go on. I'd love to explore the attitude of Paul that even though he's being thrown out of town after town after town, he doesn't give up. I'd love to explore the idea that hearts and minds of others were being poisoned against the word of God. I'd love to explore the idea of faithful men and women coming and gathering around Paul as he lay there, praying for him and that healing that took place. There's so much that we can learn from this story. And I won't be here next week, but in two weeks, we're going to pick it up again. Because there's so many things that we need right now in our lives that are right here in these words. So come back in two weeks and we will revisit from sacrifices to stones. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your forgiveness. And God, may, may this be a week that you teach all of us to walk in your grace and in your love. Father, we know so many people are walking around feeling like we've been pelted with rocks. and Just every direction they come, finances and relationships and job and the economy, and they just keep coming one after another after another. And sometimes it feels like we've been drug out and, and just left for dead. But Father, just like in our story this morning, Help us to hang on to the faith of brothers and sisters around us who are praying for us, who are gathering around us to lift us up when we're down. Father, may we draw strength from you when we feel like we just can't go on any longer. And if we're not the ones being left behind, and we're not the ones being hit, then for the rest of us, may we be people that come to the aid of a hurting brother or sister. May we support them with prayer and with faith, showing them the same amount of love that we have received from you, Father. Oh, we're so thankful. And for all of us, Father, may we find 
strength in you for each new day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being here today. Please come back next Sunday. But in the meantime, be looking for people in your life who are hurting, people who feel like they've been hit by a pile of rocks, drug out of town and left for dead, and stand with them, pray with them, pray for them, and then ask them to come to church with you next Sunday. God bless you.